The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Tired of being what they say are doormats and punching bags, and tired of being blamed for the failures in education, America's teachers have formed an organization called BAT, the Badass Teacher Association. That's what I said, that's right. In fact, a uh, Bronx professor at Fordham University founded the organization, and they now have literally thousands of members from across the country on their Facebook page, an indication that teachers as Bat claims, have never felt more embattled or more alone. So tonight, we welcome the badass teachers. We have a college professor and a public school teacher with us to talk teachers and education. And if you'd like to weigh in with comments or questions, call us at 718-960-7241, or you can email them to us at bronxtalk at hotmail.com, and we'll read those on the air during a future edition of our program. Please join me in welcoming a couple of badass teachers and if that's not Bronx language, I don't know what it is. <laughs> nice to have Fordham Professor and the founder of BAT, Mark Nason, back with us. Good evening, it's Dr. Nason. great Nason. to be here again, Gary. Thank you. And also from uh, MSHS 141 in the Bronx, it's Michael Flanagan. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nason, let's uh, talk with you. Um, what is BATS? Why is BATS? How did it form and how did we get to this moment? Um, for the last five years, I've been very concerned about the demonization of teachers in the press and the uh, excess of testing, which is pushing out any sort of creativity from our schools. And I became very involved uh, in Bronx history projects, which all got pushed out of the schools. And I've been writing about education policy for the last four or five years. It seems like things just keep getting worse. More tests, more assessments, more attacks on teachers. So June 14th, an education activist from Oklahoma named Priscilla Sandstead and I decided, well, teachers seem pretty fed up. We're going to create a Facebook page called the Badass Teachers Association. Using Think, that bit of attitude that yeah, you have yeah. tucked away somewhere. You know, and I was we're thinking, okay, we'll get two, three hundred people, and it'll be a place for people to vent and strategize. By the end of the weekend, we had 2,000. And we had no idea this was going to happen. People from all over the country bringing in their friends said, we've had enough. Nobody respects us. Nobody listens to us. They uh, blame us for the failure of schools uh, in, in poor, embattled neighborhoods. And they're judging us on the basis of student test scores, forcing us to teach to the test. So it just kept growing and growing and growing because all over the country, teachers felt nobody listened to them and everybody blamed them. And what you haven't said, and I'm going to jump in with, is that right now that 200 to 2,000 is literally up to almost 30,000 people who are on that Facebook page right. that changes. Not only there. that, but we have organizations in every state, which we call bat organizations. So there's New York bats, Connecticut bats, Florida bats, California bats, Alaska bats. You know, um, what was really interesting to me is normally you'd think, and, and you're, of course, very urban and, and uh, have been working in the, in the Bronx for, for many, many years and writing about the Bronx for many, many years. You'd think that you would have an association with somebody from the Bronx, but you said you made this association 
conversation originally with somebody from Oklahoma. So these are not only New York City issues or even large urban city issues, but issues that resonate apparently across well, well, the country. But no child left behind, which was with the Bush administration, was a national policy. Race to the top of the Obama administration is a national policy. The common core standards which are being imposed without field testing in schools across the country are national policies. What's happening in the Bronx is happening in Oklahoma, is happening in Colorado, so is happening the, so in Arizona. I mean, I mean, like any Facebook phenomenon, when one told another told another, it wasn't limited to just New York, Detroit, Dallas, Chicago. It was literally nationwide. Literally. Hawaii, Alaska. Unbelievable. Mr. Flanagan, yes. let's bring you into the dialogue. Now, you told me as soon as you'd heard about it, there were things about BAT that resonated for you. Why, why did you, immediately after they came aboard, as soon as you heard it, you thought it was something you ought to belong to? Well, partially because I grew up in the Bronx myself, and when, when it came up on my news feed on my Facebook and I saw a Badass Teachers Association, I, I just thought it was another just straight post, but I started reading um, what people were posting and what the information coming from other states and teachers just sort of pouring their hearts out um, in frustration and, and sometimes fear. And the information was just opening my eyes about um, the Common Core state standards and the race to the top and, and the corporate funding behind um, the deforming of education basically mm -hmm. is what it, what it is. So I, I immediately just read into it, and I saw Mark's posts and Priscilla's, and I just friended almost everybody on my Facebook. Well, well, you know, I read some of those things as well. What are the things that, as a teacher, that strike you? What do you hear from people, could be from Oklahoma or anywhere in the country, that make you say, you know what, this is something I have in common with teachers elsewhere? The consistency of attacks, the consistency of strategy that was, was being used um, not only on teachers in, in the Bronx that I was friends with, but looking at what was happening to people in Tennessee and in Florida and North Carolina and, and Chicago, Philadelphia. And it was like a concerted attack, and it was sort of uniform policies that they were throwing at us. And after becoming a member of the group and, and seeing it explode like that, just, just blow up on Facebook, um, I realized that we weren't alone and we were in a bigger fight than any of us um, could ever imagine. In other words, you, you might have been isolated and say, well, we in the Bronx feel a certain way, but once you realize there was a commonality, then of course yeah. it got larger. Yeah, let me raise something, just put things in perspective. There's a school in the Bronx, not too far from Fordham, uh, where the UFT chapter chair came to visit me. It's a school that is in danger of being closed if its test scores don't go up. He says a third of the teachers in the school are on medication for depression ang or oh anxiety. Goodness. He says they're teachers who can't get out of the car in the morning to go to the school because they're teaching in fear. That they, and then they transmit the fear to the students because if you don't pass, do better in these tests, the school gets closed, I lose my job, or I go, I become, you know, APP, you know, the, go to the rubber room. It's, the pressure is unbelievable. And let me tell you what the worst thing is mm -hmm. in the Bronx. We have the highest obesity rates in, in the state, right? Mm -hmm. They're canceling recess to do test prep. They're doing test prep in gym well, because everybody's afraid of the schools getting close. Let, let me step back and, and uh, repeat the kind of thing that we see in, let's say, daily news editorials and New York Post editorials and other, um, uh, you know, uh, newspaper editorials. And that is, the UFT is a big problem because their rules and their hours uh, and they allow teachers who don't do well, who have been gaming the system for years, to continue doing that. And that resource of teacher time and money that's put into teachers are one of the big problems in our school system because you know what the UFT is in the way of allowing or in, insist allowing the Department of Education to make sure like any employer would want to do that people are performing properly I'll start with you um, well I, I think that's sort of a, an overrepresentation of, of a, a small percentage of teachers but that is what we hear and that that's is what, what the hear. editorials that's are saying that's what you hear 
but that's that's you know propaganda basically they're trying you know they're disregarding 95 percent of the good teachers and they're harping on the five percent of the teachers that are are yeah maybe they need to go um, that's why we have due process that's why we have investigations um, the UFT is not trying to keep bad teachers in those positions what we are trying to do what they are trying to do is protect our due process so I mean one of the questions you asked me before w before we sat down was why would I come on this show in this climate to to speak out and that's why because I have those protections that the UFT have fought for mm -hmm. so I'm sitting here and I love my school and I love teaching um, and I'm sitting here right now so other teachers can can come out. Are, are you we're going to give uh, Dr. Nason a chance to respond to my question as well. But uh, um, are you aware of teachers who've been penalized for speaking out or for things like that or demonized in that way for doing what you done? Or is, is that kind of fear uh, palatable? It is a fear. Um, and it's I don't know anyone who's come on a television show recently <laughs> and uh, spoken out. Okay. But um, it is a real fear for teachers, and um, I mean, I guess I thought about it, but uh, I'd rather be here talking out about yeah, it. Now. You know, I, I will tell you from from my perspective, and I obviously host this program. Over the years, uh, when there was independence uh, from uh, before we had mayoral control and the Department of Education was the Board of Education, over the years we've always been able to have dialogue with teachers and other school officials about what's going on in the schools. But since that happened, it becomes very difficult to do it because the, I find there is a fear of, of yeah. speaking but, out. But let me Let's ask go back the to the UFT you. question. Okay. Um, the best public schools in the country are unionized. Places like Scarsdale, Brookline, uh, Chappaqua. You can't correlate union membership with failed schools. The, the problem in New York City public schools is you have incredible poverty and instability among, among students who um, make it very difficult to have a consistent uh, program of educational success for a large portion of them. Uh, we have large numbers of recent immigrants. People are moving from apartment to apartment and neighborhood to neighborhood. In the Bronx, 20% of the kids are brought up by grandchildren. So the same union that's in Scarsdale has one set of results and a very different set in the Bronx. So the issue is if you get rid of the union, is it going to get better? Or you're still going to have the same, your, your implication is you're going to have the same underlying factors yeah. and it won't And change. not only that, well, but it's one other thing. You're going to lose. It. Believe it or not, there are a lot of great teachers in the Bronx. And I've met a whole bunch of them. You take away their union protection, they're getting out. You know, there is a control, uh, if you were going to do a, a test study, and the control is charter schools. Yeah. In that you have charter schools that uh, many of them do not uh, have to adhere to uh, uh -huh. union regulations. Uh, they, they, they claim they're providing more flexibility. Teachers put in more hours. Uh, they have uh, uh, the ability to evaluate and eliminate or move teachers around as necessary based on performance. Uh, does that model work? And if is, you look that, at, a way if you look of, is this, that a way of applying this? If you this? look at the statistics across the country, charter schools do not outperform public schools, if you look at the, the pattern as a whole. Uh, if you look at individual charter schools that are high performing, you have to look at how many of the students are pushed out because they're uh, special needs students, or ELL students. You're saying they pre-select who gets it, to go It's into not necessarily pre-select. It could be push out. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no evidence and by, by any researcher that shows charter schools outperform public schools. There are individual charter schools that are a great success. There are individual charter schools uh, which are corrupt. And, and, you, you put out an email, actually, and I, I do want to bring Mr. Flanagan in. I want to talk about this teacher evaluation system that came out. But you put out an email recently about a, uh, a Bronx community charter school saying that the model works. It, yeah. what, now, why does that model work, and does that say something about unionism, uh, whereas other uh, charter schools, uh, at least according to you, okay. don't necessarily work? Okay. 
the Bronx Community Charter School is, is a parent-run school which is very resistant to all the testing that, that's going on. To me, it's very much like the portfolio schools that exist, which are exempt from state tests, which are, in, in other words, there are schools like that charter school, which are New York City public schools, which have been exempted from testing. The, the key thing is the philosophy of this school. It, most charter schools do not have this philosophy, and most public schools don't get a test exemption. Uh, let's get into this teacher evaluation thing. There was a lot made of the fact that the city was going to lose a lot of money. In fact, the city did actually lose some money because they were unable to negotiate a, a teacher evaluation um, a program uh, with the UFT and uh, the Department of Education. Now, there's a new four-tiered system uh, which uh, they say will streamline the teacher termination process, getting bad teachers out. Uh, and if a teacher is rated ineffective twice, uh, that re represents a strong pattern of incompetence. Presumably, you don't want to see incompetent teachers in there. Do you like this system? Is this a way to at least evaluate or get bad teachers out of the classroom? No. First of all, the money that they offered was more or less of a bribe. Um, and what You're they, talking about the, the funding the that would have been cut, the race right. to the top. So they okay. jumped in and they changed the laws just to get the race to the top bribery from the federal government. Um, and then what are you determining is ineffective teachers? They're, they're using test prep companies like Pearson that are coming in and they're, they're manipulating the exams. We're not even seeing the results. Parents don't see the entire exam. And then we're getting an, an algorithm of an uh, effective or ineffective rating and then they're labeling you um, ineffective. What would be a good uh, system? Now, let, let's just uh, review. The state of Massachusetts requires that measures of student learning be piloted uh, and uh, that student, uh, excuse me, that teachers be evaluated not by one set of scores but by trends over time. Is that the kind of, uh, uh, you know, substitute evaluation system you'd like? What, well, what would be a good way of improving our evaluation of teachers that you would think is fair? Well, just the high stakes testing alone is not the answer. The fact that you're basing student test scores um, and you're using that to determine like a teacher's um, employment, I, there's there's no data that, that that shows that that's an actual you know legitimate evaluation method. Um, we call it a snapshot. You, you're looking at a snapshot of student performance, and you're linking that to teachers. Mm -hmm. um, when you're taking out poverty as, as the biggest indicator of performance on So you're a, saying that maybe there could be an algorithm or some adjustment based on the, the uh, children that come in there. I can see he's jumping out of his skin. Yeah, I mean, when they had the teacher ratings that were published in the newspapers, my wife said they, there was no correlation between the, the actual effectiveness of the teachers as understood by the principal, the other teachers, the parents. And what was listed. Now, you're, we should uh, qualify that your wife is a principal. She's a, a principal, of, principal of one of the highest rated public schools in the city. Mm -hmm. She said but that what, what people say is the current system of value added is junk science because it measures very small variations in test scores from year to year. Um, so. You're, you're, you're simplifying, first of all, using, these tests are meant to diagnose right. And what students. you're doing is you're evaluating someone's overall performance based on that. Right. Well, but, the, but tests were originally intended to be diagnostic of student levels of performance not so teachers. teachers can help them. And then using the same test for students is, uh, well, is inappropriate. One quick question for Mr. Flanagan, then we're going to take a couple of calls. Um, are teachers teaching to the test, and is, I guess we've suggested it, or you guys suggested it earlier in the show, are they teaching to the test, and is the notion of these tests really an ominous thing for teachers because they have to change their teaching philosophy in order to get the kids through the there test? There is no choice but to teach to the test now. Um, it, it, it's, you, there is no other... That's the goal. That it's not the teacher's goal. No, I understand. That is that. the school because the principals are also being evaluated the same way we are. I mean, just before I came on here, I saw that 40% of Syracuse teachers um, were just released today. 40%? 40% of Syracuse teachers were put on teacher improvement plans. 40%. That means by next June, that 40% is, is looking at 
expedited right. termination. You know, I, w I would say that we're going to have to replace those teachers. And With I who? I, well, I was about to say, I wonder what the quality of the new teachers uh, are going to be compared to the 40%. We are basically in, in inculcating educational malpractice in principals and teachers doing things they know are wrong and borderline abusive because they so will they lose to, their jobs. Let's uh, go to the telephone. It's Elsa from Gun Hill Road. Elsa, hello. Good evening. Uh, Elsa is sounding very much like a busy signal. <laughs> uh, let's uh, bring on Bob from Riverdale. Hello, Bob. Nice to talk to you. How are you, how, Bob? How are you? We're good. As What's the up? former PA president of 141, where one of your guests is from, okay. it was a beautiful school. My daughter graduated the high school there. And, uh, well, I hope you can tell me what happened to the school. <laughs> but that's besides the point. Oh, I thought that was that's a reasonable no, no, no. question. But Gary, uh, what is this, the question? These past 12 years have been an indictment of Mike Bloomberg. He has said to hold himself accountable, and nobody did. Okay. He has been one of the worst mayors for education, and okay. uh, it shows. Got it. Uh, I, 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 let's do the first question first. What happened at 141? Where is is his perception somewhat correct? I, I think it's very skewed. Uh, um, I've been teaching there for eight years. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of 141. Um, I look forward to going there every day. Um, I, I don't know what the misconception he has okay. in it. My daughter, who's sitting right over there, will be attending that school in two years. And, and I'm happy no to have her there. Let, let's talk about mayoral control, and that is we're going to have a new mayor. Um, is mayoral control, we'll start with you and then we'll let Dr. Nason weigh in on it, is mayoral control in and of itself the problem, or is it this mayor and the way he has applied it? In other words, if Joe Loder or Bill de Blasio is mayor, uh, are, are we still have a problem because it is mayoral control, or do you think things will improve? I think mayoral control is a tactic that's being used by, by the, the corporate ed reformers um, to centralize power and take the communities out of you know, decision making in the schools. I think it's a tactic. I don't think it's Bloomberg or, you know, I think it's putting too much power in one person's hands. Mm -hmm. uh, will it get better with a new mayor? Uh, uh, I say, uh, I mean, either Lodo or de Blasio I think, mayor? Uh, I mean, I know Bill de Blasio. He's from my neighborhood. He's very critical of the testing. I agree with a lot of what he says about preschool and after school. However, I agree with Mike that mayoral control is a vehicle to undermine local democracy and parent and community input. The idea is that schools are too important to let But didn't we have just an immense amount of corruption and, and politicking okay, wait, okay. with the school boards? Wait, it's, Wasn't it's, that a very big issue? Okay, now the corruption is at the top. <laughs> it's worse. It's Pearson getting the money rather yes. than guys in the neighborhood. I'd rather the neighborhood politician get the money than corporations like Murdoch and Pearson. No, there is more money being funneled to powerful interests now with no uh, and, uh, control oversight. or oversight than ever before. Or even commitment to actual right. education. Yeah, and who is making the money? See, what I say, follow the money trail. You know, in, in, you know, community control, some of the money went to people in the neighborhoods. Now it's all going to these multinational corporations. This is a huge hustle to take money from the public sector and put it in the private sector. Let me read you something right off the Common Core website, because uh, you talked about the Common Core standings, and this is really their statement of, of purpose. Uh, and that is that the Common Core state standards provide a consistent, clear understanding of what students are expected to learn so teachers and parents know what they need to do to help them. The standards are designed to be ro robust and relevant to the real world, reflecting the knowledge and skills that our young people need for success in college and careers. And then it goes on. Isn't that what we want from our schools? Don't we want to have a consistent curriculum that everybody understands so we all know what the bottom line well, is? Absolutely not because our children are, are incredibly diverse. Do we have the same curriculum for special needs students and test them the same way we have other students for ELL students? We are humiliating to the point of abuse whole categories of students for whom these tests are developmentally <coughs> inappropriate. And 
What about things like vocational and technical education? We once had great vocational and technical high schools in New York. Now we have this one size fits all model, which is institutionalizing mediocrity. Mr. Flanagan, um when teachers had more control, let's say, over a curriculum, wasn't it dangerous that, you know what, you'd be teaching one thing in an eighth grade class and somebody else would be teaching something else, and then the children would have a whole range of different uh, outcomes when they graduate? No. Or we, didn't graduate? We've always had curriculums. I always tailored my lesson plans to, to the New York State curriculums. Um, this, this common core thing is, is more or less developed by by corporations like from you know Bill Gates and and you know funded to the states just as a means Do of you control. you believe it, 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 it's in part the type of uh, curriculum because they don't fully understand education is uh, uh, developed by corporate people not educators. Right and and I think it's a tool I, take I, control of I do space. want to ask one thing just before we run out of time. I know we could talk about, you could talk about Common Core all night. Um, what do you expect the outcome of this to be? I mean, we're talking now, these standards are all the way up into the federal government, way into the um, Secretary of Education. What do you anticipate the result of this BAT movement will be? In five years, Common Core and, and nas nationwide data collection will be in tatters because there is a, a building revolt of teachers, parents, and more sophisticated students against this top-down, profit-driven uh, education, which pushes out art, which pushes out music, which pushes out creativity. So the revolt now is just at the beginning. Um, Mr. Flanagan, um, what would you like to see? We've got about 20 seconds. Um, well, I'd just like to say that this we're going to win because my daughter needs to go to school and she needs to be happy. So we're our backs are against the wall, and we're going nowhere. Thank you, uh, Michael Flanagan, for your commitment to the children of the Bronx, and Dr. Nason. Thank you for just speaking, 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 <laughs> speaking, and of course, always being a great guest on the show. And uh, folks, if uh, you have further comments or questions on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, you email them to us at bronxtalk at hotmail.com or you make a comment on our Facebook page or the Badass Teachers right. page mm -hmm. and uh, we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. Our archives are always available at bronxnet.org. You look at the right-hand navigation bar and you click Bronx Talk. You can become a fan of us on Facebook. Now, next week, it'll be one of the most exciting programs we've ever done. We'll celebrate our 19th anniversary. That's right, 19 years of Bronx Talk and we'll do it with what I think is one of the most important proposals in the Bronx's history and that is to turn the Kingsbridge Armory into the Kingsbridge National Ice Center and our guests next week will include a New York sports icon who is now the CEO of the project yes NHL Hall of Famer Mark Messier will be here to talk about the Kingsbridge National Ice Center should be a great night and I hope you will join us it's the first time he's given an extensive interview about this project Messier and the Kingsbridge National Ice Center on Bronx Talk next Monday night at 9 on BronxNet 67 and Files 33. I certainly am looking forward to it. Hope you are too. Thanks to our producer, Jane, our director, Shirley. Uh, Dina is the studio coordinator, the cast of thousands. And to you, we'll see you next week. Good night.